Microplastics penetrate the brain. Two hours will be enough. New research suggests that tiny pieces of plastic can make their way into the brain in a very short time. In mice fed microplastic contaminated food, plastic particles were found just two hours after ingestion. Unfortunately, we are dealing with the risk of contact with microplastics at every step. It is present in the air, water and soil. The ubiquitous contact with plastics causes their pieces to get into our bodies. In a study last year, scientists showed that we consume up to 5 grams of microplastics per week. Recently, researchers also identified a new disease affecting seabirds, caused not by bacteria or viruses, but by tiny particles of plastic that get into the digestive tract. Recent research by researchers from the University of Vienna and the University of Debrecen showed that small particles of polystyrene, a widely used plastic commonly used for food packaging, can be detected in the brains of lab mice as early as two hours after ingestion. These plastic specks, researchers say, may increase the risk of neuritis, neurological disorders or neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. The description and results of the research were published in the journal, Nanomaterials. Microplastics are pieces of plastic with a size of 0.1 to 5,000 micrometers. It is found on human skin, hair, saliva, lungs, stool samples, and blood. It is estimated, for example, that drinking bottled water during the year we are able to absorb as much as 90,000 such particles. This material not only enters our digestive system, but can also penetrate the intestinal barrier. Also of concern is that microplastics have been found in the meconium, first feces, of newborns. And this means that microplastics are able to cross even the blood placental barrier. And unfortunately, scientists say that it can easily move around inside our body. It is therefore not surprising that the presence of microplastics in our body is associated with numerous diseases. However, there is still no precise study of what damage it can cause. The world of medicine has suspicions about its potential impact on the functioning of our brain. Scientists believe that plastic particles are able to contribute to the formation of inflammation neurological disorders and even neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's diseases. So far, however, it has not been clear whether microplastics can even access the brain. Because in order to do so, it would have to cross the blood-brain barrier. In order to determine whether plastic can get into the brain, studies have been conducted on rodents. Micro and nanoplastic particles, specifically polystyrene, were used for this purpose. They were given to mice orally. Then, after two to four hours, the mice were euthanized to collect brain samples. Based on the samples examined, the researchers found that the smallest of the molecules could be found in the brains of the rodents after just two hours. However, as it also turns out, the size of the particles matters. The presence of the largest ones in the brains of mice was not found at all. The key, however, was to determine where exactly microplastics can get there. For this purpose, special computer simulations were used, with the help of which it was possible to track the potential passive mechanism of transporting plastic particles to the brain. This mechanism is aided in part by cholesterol molecules that help overcome the cellular barrier that is supposed to protect the brain from toxins and pathogens. In this way, it was simultaneously possible to discover a completely new way through which microplastics can move at all. Research will be important to better understand the impact of these harmful molecules on our bodies. 
In the meantime, however, it will be crucial to do everything possible to minimize the risk of them entering our bodies. Frozen tardigrades stop the biological clock. Tardigrades are organisms specialized in adapting to harsh environmental conditions. They can survive in extremely low temperatures, endure enormous pressure and go without water for many years. They can also survive in space. Now the researchers checked what happens to frozen tardigrades. It turned out that in such conditions these organisms do not age. Tardigrades, also called water bears because their gait resembles that of a bear, belong to the family of protostomes. These animals are barely a millimeter in size. But in the course of evolution they have managed to perfectly adapt to rapidly changing environmental conditions. They can dry to a crisp in unbelievable heat or freeze in extremely low temperatures and still survive. They don't die. They just fall into a deep sleep, explains Ralph Schill of the University of Stuttgart. New research on these fascinating animals has been published in the Journal of Zoology. For a cellular organism, freezing or drying poses various risks. But tardigrades can survive both heat and cold unscathed. They then show no visible signs of life. And this raises the question of what happens to the biological clock of these animals and whether they age in this state. In the case of tardigrades that do not have access to water for many years. After rehydration, the animals return to their normal pre-hibernation state. The team of Professor Schiller discovered this property a few years ago. Researchers dubbed the discovery the Sleeping Beauty hypothesis, because in the Brothers Grimm fairy tale, the princess falls into a deep sleep, and when the prince kisses her 100 years later, she wakes up and still looks as young and beautiful as before. It's the same with tardigrades. During periods of inactivity, the internal clock stops and only resumes when the body is reactivated, explains Schill. So tardigrades, which usually only live for a few months, can live for many years or even decades in hibernation. Until now, however, it was not clear whether this also applies to frozen animals. Do they age faster or slower than desiccated animals? Or does aging stop as well? Schill and his team conducted several experiments in which they froze a total of more than 500 tardigrades at minus 30 degrees Celsius. Then they thawed them, counted them, fed them, and refrozen them, and so on, until all the animals died. At the same time, the control group of tardigrades lived at a constant room temperature, excluding the time in the frozen state. Comparison with the control groups showed almost identical viability of the frozen animals. So even in the ice, tardigrades stop their internal clocks, just like Sleeping Beauty, concludes Schill.